Good morning. morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Glad that you're here. We are, uh, as was mentioned, we're uh, here in December. I wanted to spend some time talking about some of the the famous songs that we're used to singing around this season. And uh, I want to play something for you. See if you recognize this. Ready? that song? I know, I'm a hack at it, right? You should ask me to play it. Well, I, uh, (laughs) it begins. So, I ask if you recognize that melody, because it's a melody to one of the most recognized Christmas songs ever. Back in 1836, there was this guy named Lowell Mason, and he was listening to Handel's Messiah. Anybody ever hear that before? Okay. So Lowell Mason was listening to Handel's Messiah, and he was inspired by it. And he said, man, I would love to write a piece that had that same kind of feel or that same kind of quality to it. So he actually wound up, he ended up taking excerpts from Handel's work. And he rearranged it a little bit, and he came up with this piece of music that he called Antioch. And Mason worked for about three years after he had written the piece. He worked about three years to try to get the the lyrics right to his anthem, but he just couldn't do it. He couldn't come up with the the right words for it. But there was this song... First published in a a hymnal back in 1719, and the song was called, anybody want to guess? The song was called Joy to the World. Now, it had an entirely different melody line to it. So Mason continued to, to work on Antioch, and the more he worked on it, he became convinced that the words to the hymn Joy to the World, written by Isaac Watts, a hundred years earlier were the perfect words for his song. And I'm not sure if you all know this about some of the old hymns, but uh, much of that music was not original to the person who actually claimed to have written the music. Um, Like the hymn Amazing Grace went through a lot of different melodies before they actually settled on the Macintosh bagpipe anthem. That's what that is. And that's the melody that we know for Amazing Grace today. Well, this is the melody that we know for Joy to the World. And by the way, copyright lawyers back then, right? They would have had a heyday, wouldn't they? (laughs) People just stealing each other's words and and, uh, melodies. anyway. So anyway, Mason took Watts' lyrics and he combined them with his arrangement of Handel's music. And a hit was born. So let's go ahead this morning. And um, my voice isn't doing too well. Nor is my guitar playing. And, uh, and so Micah has volunteered to come up and sing it with us this morning. Let's go ahead and sing together, Joy to the World. Joy to the world. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Aha! I could do better than that, Micah. Ready? Yeah, I just started to sing it slow instead of that. I gotcha, gotcha. Joy to the world, the world is the world is
All right, good job, everybody. So, joy to the world. Um, <clears throat> interesting enough, the song was never meant to be a Christmas song. Right? The song was never meant to be a Christmas song. Watts wrote the verses for Joy to the World. He wrote it for strength in time of persecution. Let me explain to you what was going on in his life. Watts lived in England in the late 1600s, early 1700s. At that time, England, the national religion of England was Anglicanism. Okay? And Watts and his family were what were called back then nonconformists. Anybody want to guess what a nonconformist is? Yeah. And for those of us who uh, this morning know anything about um, the restoration movement, the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of movement that our church actually came out from, right, uh, or, or originated as, uh, they have a lot in common with, with us, with the restoration movement, a very common spirit, right? This means a nonconformist actually rejected the authority of the Anglican church over their religious lives. A nonconformist believed that Scripture already instructed us in regards to our faith and practice. And the Anglican church was seen as no better than the Catholic church. And because of something called this called the Act of Uniformity. It was something that was adopted in 1559 and then reestablished in 1662. But the, the Act of Uniformity said that if you did not submit to the Anglican Church, you could not hold public office, you could not work in civil service, and you could not go to university. Isaac Watts' father, who also was Isaac, Isaac Watts' father had been in and out of jail a lot. Anybody want to guess why he was in and out of jail? Because he was a preacher. And not only that, he was a preacher who refused to do what? He refused to bow to the Anglican church. So when Watts wrote Joy to the World, it was a song that was written to proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ. It was a song written to say, Jesus is Lord, not the Archbishop. Though he wasn't allowed to attend university, listen to this. Watts was an expert in Latin at the age of four. Fluent in Greek. At the age of eight. Mastered French by 11. And was an expert in Hebrew by the age of 13. Though not allowed to go to public school. Watts was a student of the scripture. And as a matter of fact, when he would write hymns. Oftentimes, it, those hymns would be inspired by uh, a psalm that he had read. So he would read the psalms and then he would use that as an inspiration to write a song. And so Joy to the World actually was inspired by Psalm 98. So if you have your Bible with you today, open up to Psalm 98. Today what we're going to do is we're going to read this psalm. <clears throat> and what I want you to do is, is when you think about the world around you, when we think about all of the social pressures out there on Christians, all of the pressures out there on churches to conform to things that God says are wrong, do we see any of that in our culture? Right? The culture wants the church to conform to the culture. Although the culture is saying now we need to be doing things that we do not believe are right. When we suffer, eventually when we suffer persecution for our faith, when we feel like it's better to just be accepted than to be righteous, I want you to remember the perspective that Isaac Watts brings 
by referring to this psalm that clearly speaks about the character of our God and how the character of our God should produce within us this joyous proclamation of his glory. Anybody, anybody agree with that? The realization of the character of our God should make us want to proclaim his glory. So what does the psalm say about God? Well, it reminds us, first of all, that God saves his people. Can I get an amen? amen. God saves his people. Verses 1 through 3. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Here's something to remember, not just at Christmas, but all year long. When you think about that baby in the manger, when you think about angels and shepherds, the reason there is joy to the world is because God is sending salvation in that baby Jesus, right? And we think about all the wonderful things that are said about Jesus during this time of year, right? Like, he is the Prince of Peace. What does that mean? What peace? There's still war. Nations still rage against nation. What peace is Jesus the prince of? Well, Jesus is the prince of peace in that peace is offered to you from God. God wants peace with you. And what have we been? We have been on the wrong side. We've been on the wrong side of things. We have been a part of the wrong kingdom. And because of that, we are God's enemy. And then what did he do? God sent Jesus to make peace with us. Amen. Notice, even the Old Testament. Uh, even here in the Old Testament, it talks about God caring not just for Israel, but he shows us salvation to who? To the nations, right? To all the nations, to the end of the earth. He gives salvation to the ends of the earth, it says. There's a section in Isaiah 7.14 that talks about Jesus as being Emmanuel. Anybody remember what Emmanuel means? God with us. I wrote an article in the church newsletter this last month that talked about that term. And it's taken from the writings of the prophet Isaiah. It's also used of Jesus. And I think many people misunderstand the reference Like, here's a little bit of history of Isaiah. In Isaiah's day, Israel and Syria were going on attack against Judah. And Isaiah gave a prophecy that there would be this young maiden who would give birth to a son. And not long after the son was born, Judah's enemies would fall. And Isaiah says, that will be proof to you that what? That God is with you. Right? So that quote then is also brought forward. It's also used about the virgin giving birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel, which means the same thing. God is with you. So what is Jesus proof of? That God's with you. That God is on your side. In Matthew 1, 23, Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, is proof that God is with you, that God is on your side, that God loves you, that God is offering salvation to you. Watts drew from this psalm because he believed that people needed to remember that salvation is found in Jesus. And that explains the opening words. Joy to the world. Why? The Lord has come. Right? The Lord has come. Anyone here today happy that we have Jesus as our Savior? Amen. Second thing we see about the character of God here is that he is the king of everything. What's he the king of? He is the king of everything. 
Verses 4 through 6, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing and the trumpets and the blast of a ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord. Yahweh is the king of everything. You can sing praise and you can worship God even when times are hard and difficult. You can shout for joy when the world does everything it can do to try to steal your joy. And that's through remembering who is really in control. Watts wrote in his song that we should be joyous because the king has come to earth. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. During Christmas, we see the salvation of God coming in Jesus, but we also see a king who came, a king who came. According to John chapter 1, Jesus is the pre-existent Word of God who put on flesh. Anybody ever read the beginning of John, the Gospel? Right? John doesn't just tell the Christmas story like Matthew does or like, or like or Luke does. John begins telling the story by telling us that Jesus was with the Father in the beginning and that Jesus himself is God. Paul tells us in the first chapter of Colossians that Jesus is supreme over everything, that Jesus created everything. Everything is for Jesus. Everything belongs to Jesus. Everything in the physical world, everything in the spiritual world is under his authority. And there Paul also says that Jesus is supreme over everything for a reason. Why is he supreme over everything? He is supreme over everything for the church. Right? Jesus is supreme over everything and the head of the church, Paul says. Jesus died and rose again in order to open up the way for us to rise. And we have this king who is for us. If we have that kind of king who is for us, Romans 8.31 says, who can stand against us? What's the answer? Anyone here today happy to have Jesus as your king? Amen. See, this is what those angels and shepherds realized that night in Bethlehem. This is why Watts wrote of both heaven and nature singing the wonders of Jesus, because Jesus is both king of heaven and of earth. And the third thing we see in the psalm is this, and this is verses 7 through 9. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. As Watts read this psalm, I'm sure that he thought of the imprisonment of his father, I'm sure that he thought of the unfair treatment experienced by those who simply wanted to follow the Bible. And the songs that Watts wrote were joyous declarations that our God saves, that he is the king of kings, and that he is coming back to judge. And when God judges, listen to this, he will be righteous and he will be fair. Our Savior and our King sees the unfair treatment that His people receive. Our God sees the hardships placed upon those who have truly decided to follow Him. Who will fight their battles? He will. Yet as God's people, you need to remain joyful and faithful. Romans 12, 17 through 21 says this. And uh, this verse is one that I have to read often. (laughs) 
<clears throat> it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Raise your hand if you need to hear that today. Watts reminds God's people by referring to that psalm that we need to be joyous, that we also need to be examples of love and kindness and hospitality. Paul, by writing that in Romans, is telling us that we need to be examples of love and kindness and hospitality. God sees the things you go through, and God will judge fairly. Jesus is right and fair. Anyone here today happy to have Jesus as the judge? Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Have you done that? This savior, this king, this coming judge, have you accepted him? Have you made room for him? Because Hebrews 7.25 tells us that Jesus is able to completely save those who come to him through, to come to God through him. So he is your your savior. He is able to completely save those who come to God through him. Have you made him your king? Matthew 28.18, we're told, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Is he your king? And Jesus is the judge. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 1, that now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you want him to be your judge? Because it says there there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So today, accept what Jesus has done for you. Let that burst forth into joy in your life because no matter what the world throws at you, you have the promises of God. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. You come forward if you want to make a decision for the Lord today.